You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBGive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBGive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator and your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor, your host. And with me today is a gentleman who spent a corporate career building global strategic partnerships and applying technology innovations to power results. He was a member of the founding partner group at Accenture from 1988 to 2011. He helped to transform the telecommunications market from voice to data, and now he's using those same skills to propel Powered by Action, an innovative and affordable platform that accelerates nonprofit scalability. Powered by Action enables universal access to proven nonprofit programming and helps to increase engagement and leverages rewards to incent desired behaviors that exponentially raise social impact. He's also a member of numerous nonprofit boards, both nationally and in the Chicago area. And it's great to have him here today to hear his amazing story of how he rose from very humble beginnings in Chicago to now follow his third passion, giving back to society. Andre, it's great to have you with us. Art, it's my pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, Andre, I can't wait to talk with you about Powered by Action. But before we do, I would really appreciate it if you would share with us how you came to, I guess, start something focused on social good after spending so much of your life helping corporations succeed. And we'd also like to get into how you actually rose to a career in business and where you started. So, you know, I grew up in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, in a place called Inglewood. I have two phenomenal parents. They're still with us. They were big on saving and working hard. And so I learned at least those two things from from them. But some great people were in my life throughout uh, high school and, and college at Purdue, where I studied engineering, that created some first opportunities for me that got me into corporate America, eventually over to a place called Arthur Anderson, which had a very small division, a consulting division called the Management Consulting Division. And I joined that group right after completing my master's in finance at the University of Chicago. And the reason we we joined them was because they were looking for someone with telecommunication skills and they were wanting to create a telecommunications practice. And so they were looking for some people that had, you know, steep experience. I had spent right out of Purdue about four years with AT&T, another year with MCI. I came over to, to be one of the leaders in their telecommunications business, eventually started a practice around network consulting that I founded that that grew very quickly to a billion dollar practice. I was asked to become a global managing partner, one of the probably the youngest global managing partner at Accenture. And and that's really that's kind of what started it. Along that path, another 23, 24 years I was in Africa, and I sat on our Accenture Foundation board, and there was this incredible opportunity that came to us, this organization called the African Medical Research Foundation. 
MREF wanted to train 20,000 nurses that were operating with a high school diploma and they wanted to get these 20,000 nurses to the next level of nursing and they had art they had a 100 year plan to train these 20,000 people Accenture found out about it and we said look let's work with them in a philanthropic way to help them get there faster. And we proposed a program that would train these 20,000 nurses in seven years, 93 years faster. Wow. <laughs> I mean, those numbers are shocking. 93 years faster than, than their plan. And it was through that experience, Art, that I'm now in Africa overseeing how this program is coming along. The first 89 nurses are about to graduate. I'm speaking at the graduation as one of the keynote speakers. And, you know, it, it was a heart fulfilling kind of thing. And right after that, I'm out greeting the family members. And, and I ask the leaders, I'm there for a couple of weeks, three weeks. And I asked the leaders previously to take me to the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and there was this one place, Art, called Kabira. And it's, it's well known. It's the, probably the largest slum in the world or the second largest. Nobody's competing to be the worst, right? And they just refused to take me there. But for some reason, the way I interacted with these families after this, this graduation, they were touched to, to say, okay, we're, we're going to take you. And uh, they said, do you want to go back to the hotel and change? And I said, no, 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 I, let's go just like this. And I didn't want them to change their mind. And so we're off to Kabira and we're walking through there. And Art, I, I tell you, if your listeners haven't uh, Googled Kabira in Kenya, right outside of Nairobi, I highly recommend you do it. It is one of the most amazing slums I've ever been in. I, I use the word amazing wow. because there's nothing about it wow. that you would ever contemplate. I mean, everything is radical. I mean, it is it is so, and I hate to use words that could offend people, but it is just not a good place. And, you know, if I had to think of something that wow. Um, wow. would be analogous to it. it. It wouldn't be a kind word. It wouldn't be wow. a kind place. Wow. If you could think of the worst wow. place you wanted to live eternity, that's what this looked like without me saying the word. And so I'm walking through this place yeah. and, and I'm happy to describe more, but I'm trying to get to the answer to your question. We can kind of go back and touch on any of this history that you want. And God touches my heart. I mean, melts my heart for these people. And I could hear him speaking to mm. me and saying, you know, it's time for you to come work for me. And he dropped in my spirit a vision for uniting the resources necessary to lift up a fallen people. Wow. Those were the words that I heard. The precise words that I heard were those words. And ever since then, when I got back to the U.S., I told my friends about this experience Later, God revealed this name, Powered by Action. We had picked several other names for for what we would call this, and, and they just didn't work. And one day I'm walking down Michigan Avenue in Chicago, and Power by Action comes to me. And, and we launched Power by Action, a 501c3 nonprofit organization focused on building technology uh, building software innovations that would change the service delivery and program delivery paradigm for nonprofits all around the world. And so my wife and I have been pouring our personal resources. We've not asked anybody for money. This is very risky, as you would imagine, to build a technology platform like this. It had never been done before until now. And in the last couple of years, we've been working with nonprofits to introduce them to the platform, to onboard them, their staffs, their constituents or people that they serve, 
and working with them to deliver their services digitally and virtually. And who would have thought that 10 years ago, God would have given us this vision. And then one year ago, COVID hit the world. And as I was mentioning to you earlier, everything has just been exponential growth in the last 12 months. And so that's the that's the quick story, Art. We could talk about any facet of that that you want, but that's the cliff note. Well, the facet that I want to talk about is you being there in Africa and actually being so moved by what you saw that you believe that there was more for Andre to do aside from the amazing work that you'd already done connecting people digitally in the business world that you needed to now get to work on this new passion that had automatically just seemed to come to you and you followed it. And obviously you say 10 years, you've been working on this for some time. It's not something that just immediately came together. I'm sure that when you told some people about this, they were probably in somewhat of a maybe disbelief or or doubtful mode about what you were doing, but you persisted anyway. I'm really curious about how you silenced those voices and continue to do this. So Art, the plan was, you know, one of the wonderful things about Accenture is that we were a partnership. We took the company public. And with any IPO, there's this opportunity to acquire substantial wealth, especially for those individuals that are part of the founding partner group, of which of which I'm one of the founding partners. And so the plan was that I had no plan. <laughs> and and so I thought that the only plan that my wife and I had was that when I turned 50, that I would retire. And 10 years ago, I turned 50. And so that was really the the only plan. I, I, I wasn't looking forward to playing golf. I wasn't looking forward to, to traveling. My wife was looking forward to traveling. I wasn't so much looking forward to traveling. Uh, I think you know that every week I was in three different countries helping build our business at Accenture. Every week, every month, every year. I travel 15 different airlines, and on one I have, just to give you an example, I have over 7 million miles on one of those 15. So I had done enough, and I was just looking forward to hanging out at home and doing nothing. Not that, you know, my wife didn't think that that would last for long, but 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 I was exhausted. I, I, that's what I wanted to do. And so when this inspired vision was not not just an inspired vision but it was an inspired vision that i received and it was nothing that i aspired to it it wasn't a part of my plan you know i didn't want to i had no plan to start a charity or a foundation and you know my wife and i give and we're happy to give and we continue to give to others but we had no I had no plan to start a charity or a nonprofit. My second my second act was going to be just taking it easy and enjoying the fruits of 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 the career. And when when I heard this inspired vision and and what I was to do, I was captivated by it to say the least. And it became a part of me like nothing else ever before in my life other than my family, my wife and my kids and my parents and my brother. There's nothing else that compares to it. And so I became, it became me and I became it. I became this inspired vision that God had given me and and, and it became me. And all that I could tell you is when you're on his team. He puts something down in you that that just commits you to the vision in a way that's unshakable. That's that's really the only way that I could explain it, Art. And so when I, I read about 
you know, different Bible stories, I can understand them better now because even, even though people were telling me, hey, listen, it is, it is not going to rain. You do not need to build this ark. I, I was destined to do it. And I had been given the resources to do it. And so I was off doing it. And I don't know that I even tried to silence the voices. I just did what I did in my business career for those people that doubted that we were going to grow a business or succeed growing a business. I just would tell my teams, you know, focus on the plan, execute the plan. Don't be distracted by, you know, naysayers or any sayer. And so this was no different for me. And and so I just stayed focused. I had learned how to do that. And uh, that has brought us to this point. Well, let me just ask you, were you particularly uh, faith oriented or religious oriented prior to this vision? Or is this something that sort of came later or came during? No, I've I've my faith has been a center point of my life, Mm -hmm. pretty much all of my life. And, you know, so this was not unusual. I had heard about things like this, but, you know, it it had never happened to me. And so I was also excited that I would be a steward of something that God wanted me to do and a vision that he had. And for those individuals that, that have a similar belief or faith, you know that we're we're always excited to be a part of his plan, his master plan. Yeah. And so I see it that way. My wife sees it that way. My kids see it that way. And as, as things began to materialize over 10 years, I mean, you're going through some valleys, some mountains. I mean, the the road is rough. You know, it's not for the faint of heart. And when you're using your personal resources, and the amount of those resources are measured in seven or eight digits to the left of the decimal point. (laughs) Got it. It's not for the faint of heart. And so you've, you've got to have, you, you have to have some faith, some belief. And, and I did. And, and maybe that had something to do with why this was, was given to me. Well, I'll tell you, um, we've certainly, appreciated that many people are moved to help mankind for a variety of reasons. One might be that they just believe that humans should be all uh, given the same opportunities to thrive and succeed. Others just happen to feel good when they give. But like you, there are others who are moved because of their faith to do things and to support mankind. So you are a testimony, I believe, to people who follow that voice, who are moved by uh, their faith to do things. And it's it's really great to hear you talk about this so freely and to sort of acknowledge for those who are moved that this is indeed a, a motivation and it should spur them to action as it has you. You know, Art, it's a it's it's an inspiration. It's a it's an inspired vision. And I I want to make sure that 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 I don't take any credit. I want to be careful not to take any credit. There is nothing about this vision that I created. Everything that we're doing is God inspired. And I had none of these thoughts. Not one, not one of these thoughts I had and not one of these thoughts I personally created. And so Mm. it goes far beyond motivation. This is, this is a direct line of receiving a vision that God had for me to carry out me and many other people, because You know, he has a master plan, and that plan, as you know, even in the role that you play now, involves many, many, many other people and many, many other organizations. 
and and so does this. And so even yeah. <laughs> even being connected to you, I think, is part of the plan. And so he he has a a troop, an army of of people that he has drop something into their personal spirits uh, to do on behalf of him for others. And so this second part or second act, if you want to call it that, for me, is all about creating success for others, yeah. which for me is the definition of significance. So I'm, I'm now focused on creating significance by creating success for others. And service is at the epicenter of that. So let's talk for a bit about the powered by action. What are we talking about, Andre? What does powered by action do? And how have you been able to grow it through its infancy to something that is really now beginning to pick up major steam? And the portend is that it will have significant impact on all of us. Well, Art, I will, I'll describe it this way and maybe give you some examples that can further amplify one or two use cases that, that will be appealing to those individuals listening in. N- number one, I grew up, as I said before, on the South Side of Chicago in a place called Inglewood. And when you, when you hear about South Side and you hear about Inglewood, it's, it's often in the news. The median income is probably in the twenty-three thousand dollar range. It's probably fourteen thousand seven hundred per capita, something like that. Unemployment is about eighteen point six percent. That's reported, so it's probably twice to three times that actually, because you know once unemployment runs out, those numbers don't calculate the actual unemployment really, really well. But the one that they do calculate, I think if you were to Google Inglewood in Illinois, it's about 18.6%. That's where I came from. And my parents worked at the steel mill and the post office, didn't go to college, insisted that my brother and I go. So I knew a lot about people that needed help. I knew a lot about it because that's how I grew up. And one of the things that I can tell you is that I can't remember, and I've thought about it, I can't remember, other than a church, I can't remember any other nonprofit or charity anywhere in the neighborhood that I grew up. So I know that there are nonprofits and charities doing incredible work and with great intentions, but access to these resources is a barrier. And so so this vision had to do with how do we create equitable access to resources? A second part of the vision is how do you unite or bring those resources together to make them collectively accessible? Because as you know, Art, there's not one thing that people need that will change their lives indefinitely. Usually it's a diverse suite of things that people need. And so, I mean, you need some of the basics and food and shelter and clothing, but then you also need knowledge. And then when you double click on knowledge, you need all kinds of knowledge. You need knowledge about how to care for yourself, how to parent, how to uh, create a budget, how to invest. You need knowledge to get a job. You need knowledge to stay healthy. So you need, you need to be health literate and you need to eat the right things. You need to exercise. I mean, there, there is a plethora of things that we need access to when it comes to resources. And so Power of Action focuses on those organizations that are providing programs and services to people that need programs and services. So Intangible things like knowledge, intangible things like skills, intangible things like counseling and therapy and these kinds of things we focus on. So these are normally programs that are delivered in person. 
And when you deliver anything in person to a group of people that need help, these same barriers of access are, are prevalent. And so it's very difficult if you have no car and transportation to get to a physical location where that counseling, where that knowledge is, if you don't have transportation, you can't get there. And if you live in a very unsafe place, then you don't want to be transporting yourself and your kids at certain hours of the day and night. And so these barriers are significant, these barriers to access to the resources. Power of Action is all about how do we tear down these barriers of access to make access to this knowledge equitable. And so in today's world, Art, when you're thinking about, you know, health disparities and you look at something like a chronic disease like diabetes, we're working with uh, the CDC and organizations like Black Women's Health Imperative that deliver the CDC certified diabetes prevention program. And we're working with them to digitize it and to deliver it virtually so that more people can get access to it. And the CDC and Black Women's Health Imperative are are two of our great partners that we work through and with. And this last year, we created this, this digital version of this successful program that the CDC and Black Women's Health have invested so much in. They probably trained about 3,500 people. The CDC program is a year-long program art, and Black Women's Health has about an 89% retention. But they've only trained about 3,500 people in three years. So they want to train 35,000 people a year. They want to train 100,000 people a year or in three years. And so they're looking, they were looking for a partner like us where we could take their program that's delivered in person, digitize the content, deliver it by pushing the content through short messages that are two to three minutes long, that are embedded with video so that you can read the message. You, you know, when you get the mobile push notification, like an alert, you click it. The message comes up. You can read it in two to three minutes. You can watch it or listen to it. You can comment and ask questions. And that starts this new delivery paradigm around digital. And so embedded in this art is you know that most people that are being served by a nonprofit maybe sees that nonprofit three or four times a month. It's very difficult to create results and impact at three to four times a month when it needs to be 30 to 40 times or 50 to 70 times a month. And so now pushing this content out, creating this discussion, commenting, asking questions is very powerful to increase the number and the frequency of interactions needed to create changes in behavior patterns. So that's really one dimension of the technology. Another dimension is after you receive so many of these messages, You're invited to a live event where someone amplifies on the content that you've previously received to amplify your understanding. You receive a third type of message called an activity. Now that you've understood the content, it's been amplified upon. This third message is about an activity that you're, you're asked to go do to demonstrate what you've learned. And then this fourth element is around polling and surveying the audience, you know, ahead of the topic with certain number of questions and then asking them after the topic to gauge progress. So that's really what Power of Action is doing. We're creating innovations that take the in-person dimension that's riddled with barriers and, and turning it into a way to interact and connect and teach and learn and support one another digitally and virtually to tear down those barriers that have plagued communities like the communities that I've grew up in. So Andre, I want to ask you as someone coming into the nonprofit sector from the corporate sector, because a lot of times we're told that these are two very different sectors. I'm just curious about what you've learned about yourself as a leader 
because there's a message for others who may be thinking about transitioning from business to nonprofit. And also what you have learned about our sector that you might want to share with other sector leaders, given your perspective. Are there unique points of knowledge, I suspect, that you have that you might want to share with both your fellow corporate colleagues and now your new colleagues, your nonprofit leaders. So, Art, let me let me share a perspective, and that was a loaded question, so we may have to break it into parts, and if I miss something, we'll have to come back to it. But the first thing that I would say is that the for-profit sector and the nonprofit sector are similar. They're similar in that there is a customer that you are serving in both. And it is important to understand that customer and to tailor your solutions for that particular customer. Let me give you an example of what I mean. When I first got to Kenya, if you remember that part of the story, I was sitting down with the executive director of the American Medical Research Foundation, his name is Dr. Nagasha. And somehow we got on this conversation and he was saying, you know, you Westerners, you know, you have this point of view that you know it all and it would be good to check in with us to, to understand our unique environment before you suggest things so quickly. And he gave me this example of these mosquito nets that we were sending over to places like Africa for them to put these nets over their sleeping areas so that you know they wouldn't get beat, bitten by mosquitoes that were causing malaria and and other diseases. And he said, "You know, Andre, you know you know what that material looks like?" I said, "Yes." He said, "Do you know that we wrap individuals that have passed on we we wrap them in that material before we bury them or or a material like that?" And he says, you know, so how many people do you expect are going to put that over their bed? Mm. And and it's a wow. it, and so your question about corp for profit nonprofit, there is this customer in both. We got to make sure we take a moment to understand the customer, whoever that customer is. We've got to take a moment to really understand the customer. This would be number one. Uh, number two. Many of the same solutions that are good for one is good for the other. And I think we've learned economically that technology is very good for for profits. I mean, it's, it's a way to improve productivity, improve efficiency. When companies do that, they grow, they save money the value of the companies increase, technology is an enabler of all of that. I think that's the case for nonprofits too. Unfortunately, there there hasn't been easy mechanisms, as you know, where people freely give tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to build out infrastructure that can power nonprofits. And but that infrastructure is still needed. Or we will find ourselves using filing cabinets in one versus the other. We'll find ourselves needing to do things in person that could also be done you know, virtually and more efficiently virtually and at scale virtually. And so Technology to me, like customer, should be applied to both. It's just that one has it and the other doesn't. And so this this vision that we were given led us to building out technology infrastructure that would come underneath these nonprofits that had no technology infrastructure or very little, and that it would be the powering force, it would be the fuel to really extend reach to scale impact by changing the the paradigm of delivery from in-person to 
digital and virtual, or some hybrid approach that includes both. And when you think about that art, we are basically, now that it, you know it's been 10 years later, going on 11, actually it's been a little bit over 11 years because I received the vision before I retired from Accenture, about a year before I retired. So it's been about 11 years and running. And it's more clear to me today than it was on that very first day walking through Kibera how this inspired vision would leverage technology in a way to propel philanthropy worldwide. And so we're just, we're just very ex- excited that, that our expertise can power yours. And, and that's what we're all about. It's, it's front and center for us every day. We don't have the panacea for all of the things that are required, but for this one thing, you know, God's inspired vision was very clear in that how it would be leveraged in a substantial way to change the dimensions of access. And, and guess what we're talking about these days, Art, on the news? We're talking about how do we create equitable access for vulnerable populations? How do we give them access to things that they've never had? How do we give them access to know-how? How do we give them access to knowledge? How do we give them access to the right people that can, can help them do good better and be better? And so uh, I couldn't have thought of this. I could not have thought of this. And so it's just a blessing to be a part of this larger plan. And coming through all of this art, I can tell you the one thing that, that gets beaten into you is humility because, <laughs> you know, you're humble in business, but when you come over to the nonprofit world, that's the one thing that's different. You, you become really humble. What are some of your lessons in, of humility or lessons in humility? Well, it's very, very difficult to do good big. I mean, you can do good, but to do it big, there are so many people and organizations that you need. And so a spirit of humility is crucial. So you you truly have to come underneath. And that's an important word. I'm using that word very carefully. Uh, I didn't say come alongside. You have to come underneath them. And they have to feel that you are coming underneath them in order for them to trust you and to collaborate with you. And so that's a huge lesson learned for me. And when you're, when you're spending all of your time and you, you know, we don't pay ourselves anything, right? I mean, we don't pay ourselves anything. We, we spend 20 hours a day, every day for almost the last decade. And we don't pay ourselves anything. We just invest and give and give more and give more. And so over, over that period of time, a lot of ego and stuff like that is simply beaten out of you. You just don't, you just, it's literally beaten out of you. Because, you know, when you're working with technology, first of all, it doesn't work like you want it to work. And so you're going through these valleys and you're trying to get it to work and you're spending more and you're spending more time and it's still not working. And then it works and then it, you add capability and then it's not working again. So going through that over a decade of time beats whatever ego you have, it beats it out of you. I mean, you just, you become a servant. And if you thought you were a servant, you go, you go through that process and you truly become a servant. So on my business card, I have founder and servant. And, you know, I hired this marketing person and they says, look, you got to drop this servant thing and put CEO. I said, no, 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 no. I wear that badge proudly. I wear that. That's my badge. Not everybody can call themselves a servant. It took a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it took a lot of work to get that title. And that's what we're doing. Our, our technology, you know, it enables others doing great work to do it better. 
And that's really that's really what we're all about, helping nonprofits do good better. And um, we're going to launch another entity called Big Heart in the coming month or two that's going to do the same with churches. And we mm. separate that because, you know, some people get kind of unnerved with donating to a charity. We do accept donations and those donations fund the teams of people in Power of Action working with other nonprofits to implement the software. But my wife and I fund the software development and the software teams exclusively. And we give Power of Action, our nonprofit, a perpetual license to, to use it for free with no, no return money, no nothing to us. It's, it's a blessing to serve art. And it's a blessing to have been blessed enough to serve in this way. Well, let me ask you two questions. First of all, when you think about where Powered by Action has come from, does it give you a sense, given what you've learned these last 11 years, of what its potential is 10 years from now? The second question would be more about if it were to get there, what would change in our society? What would change in our, in our country and in our world? Well, let me start with the second question first. I talked about the work we're doing with the CDC and Black Women's Health Imperative and others. We are enthusiastic about that because with COVID-19, there's been a lot of talk about disparities and how Black people, for example, get the best of the worst and get the least of the best. And we've also heard how black people, when compared to their white counterparts, have chronic diseases at rates of two to three times their counterparts. That's right. We've, we've also heard of disparities in finance, where for one white person who has a dollar of wealth, a black person on average has 10 cents. Those are big disparities. And, and we know, and we've, it's been front and center for us, the disparities in education and, you know, the disparities in income, you know, for every dollar a white person earns, a black person earns about 59 cents and disparities in um, careers the the few that are CEOs and vice presidents and the few that sit on boards of directors of corporate companies compared to our white counterparts. These are broad disparities. And so what we see in the future is that those things that are catalyzed and improved by access to knowledge, we expect over the next 20 years to cut those disparities in half because of the work that we're doing. What does that mean? That means that if people with diabetes, when you compare it 20 years from now, instead of there being a 3x difference, there's going to be a 1.5x difference. When it comes to wealth creation for that dollar of wealth that white person creates or has, we expect it to be instead of 10 cents for the black person, 50 cents. And we're starting to see this. We're starting to see evidence, Art, that this is possible. Because when people know better, they do better. I am evidence of that. From where I've come from, from where I've grew up, to where I am now, I am the quintessential evidence of what's possible when you add knowledge and know-how and you add a support net that can wrap around an individual called Andre Hughes. And when given an opportunity, he steps to the plate 
and he gets on base. I mean, this is this is possible. And what's wonderful about it, I can speak about it as an individual, but we're all knowledgeable about it. We all know that this is possible. And we all know that this is this happens. So what is the question? The question becomes, how then do we move more people like Andre, more people like Art, through this pipeline of opportunity? How do we give them access to knowledge and know-how? And how do we do it in a way that they're willing to consume it? It's not like the knowledge art isn't already there. The content and the information is already there. It's just, you know, I didn't grow up reading. And so a lot of people like me don't prefer to read. So what we have to do is we have to look at the, look at the trends. I mean, people watch television a lot more than they read, especially the people that we're talking about helping. Uh, people like me, I watch more TV than I read. And so in our technology, we in, in those programs, we're embedding, we're, we're taking a thousand pages of manuals and we're turning it into 300 sound bites that can be consumed in two to three minutes. And we're embedding video in it. So people that don't want to read can click it and watch it and listen to it. And so leveraging things like this, here's another one, Art, the ability to craft these programs, crafting a diabetes program for only black women is very, very powerful. Well, Andre, why would you do that? Because it's developed in their voice. And so if they are my target audience, going back to that customer point that I mentioned before, if they are my target audience, I'm going to do everything I can to attract, retain, and be successful in delivering the key learning points necessary for them to create success. So in the Black Women's Diabetes Prevention Program, all of the videos, everything is, is only Black women. When, they, when they're attending the virtual cooking classes, the chef is Black. The, the women sitting around the table, we call it Dish Diva. Um, that are taking a culturally uh, prepared, historically culturally prepared meal and and making it more diabetic oriented or compliant. The people in those videos, everything, the language, everything is for them. And so, and the storytelling that we do is relevant to them. It's in their voice. And so we have higher expectations that these programs will be consumed by them and that they will stick with it. And so we have high expectations of what's possible when you go where they are. The problem is, is trying to go where they are and bring them where we are. You know, telling them, okay, I know you don't read and I know you don't do this and you don't do this, but we're going to get you to start doing it. I think we, we have to do art we have to say, this is what they do do, and this is what they love. How do we embed what they need to know in what they do do and what they do love? And, and that's a very different way of thinking, and we're bringing that to the philanthropic space. What I would encourage all of the incredible organizations and all of the activists and all of the people that are doing good. I would encourage you to think about how what you are doing can be powered by technology and innovation. And I would ask you to think about that, to pray about that. And if through that process of contemplation, if there's anything that you think we could help you with, uh, that you would just give us a call. We are happy that we're able to come underneath others and empower them and their missions with, with what we are doing. We're excited that our expertise can power yours. We're very excited about that. We just also are, want you to know that we stand ready to, with humility, 
to work with you and your listeners in bringing about the change that they see, especially if what we're doing could help them get there faster, quicker. Well, there is a tremendous offer to my colleagues in the nonprofit sector, and I hope and expect that many will take you up on that, Andre. I know we're going to look at some things internally to see how we can be powered by your action and the technology that you've created. So let me first just thank you, my friend, for, for following that voice and creating this wonderful platform. I also want to thank you for persevering, because as you know, as you said, our sector isn't the easiest to break into because there's so many collaborators that it takes to get things done. And finally, I just want to thank you for joining me today on this podcast and for being a friend to the nonprofit sector. And to all our listeners, let me just say thank you for listening in. This is the Heart of Giving podcast powered by bbbgive.org. I hope you'll find us on all major podcast platforms, and I hope you'll listen to our next episode. Thank you. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.com. Dot P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. Send your comments and ideas to Nona at thusmarket.com. That's Nona at thusmarket.com. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.